a lot of artists talk about this thing called flow when they're making artwork. You want to be in tune with the movement of the glass. And this beautiful rotation. You're centering your thoughts and you're centering your body. And you have those moments where you're only making your glass and you're at one with it. It's beautiful. My name's Lisa Aronson. I'm a glass blower. We're in my glass studio in Broadway, Virginia, which is located in the Shenandoah Valley. The first steps in glass blowing are turning on the ovens and prepping my tools. The furnace is always on. That's where the glass is kept. The glass comes in these 50 pound bags. I'm gonna be putting it into the charging chute. I've got a crucible inside the chamber of the furnace. That's where the glass lives. We'll fill it up once a week. It maintains a temperature of about 2,000 degrees. After I've got the equipment coming up to temperature, I need to prepare my color for the day. Most people think the color is a paint. It's not a paint, it's actually colored glass that's been formulated by chemists. It could come in powder, it could come in bar color, which can then be sawed up into chunks for me to preheat in the color oven. Then I will gather up a little bit of glass from the furnace, open the color oven, pick up our piece of color. One of the aspects of colored glass is when it's hot, it looks black. So we need to know where all the colors are and they have a specific slot in the pipe warmer. Now, each time we go into the furnace, I'm gonna turn the pipe into my clear glass and wind it on to the end of the blowpipe. Like putting honey on a spoon, that's called taking a gather. And we count our gathers so we know how much glass we have. So I'm gonna be taking a gather of clear glass. I'll go right into my crushed up white color, which gives me a base coat. Then I'm going to shape and cool that bubble to a point where it's warm enough to accept the color that my assistant, Chad, is then gonna bring over to me at the bench where I'm going to be directing the color where I want it on the bubble. All right, I'm gonna do little dots, Chad. I'm dialoguing with the piece, and I let it just be that free, like am I gonna make a circle, or am I gonna make a squiggle? And Chad actually assists me with this. He'll help hold the pipe and make sure that I can get a really nice crisp circle. Color is my biggest thing. I love color. And so whenever I even talk about glass blowing, I'm always talking about painting with the glass. I was inspired by stained glass windows, especially from the 13th century. Finding my own voice came from looking at what interested me. Art history and nature. These are my biggest influences. The glass blowing bench is where the gaffer sits. The person blowing is a gaffer. I've been able to work with Chad Kaufman for five years now. He had a degree in glass. The thing about glass blowing is years of practice. It can take up to 10 years to actually become skilled enough to be able to make your work and it is time on the bench. I listen to the radio when I'm alone in my studio. And there was a speech from the president asking America at large to help our veterans come home from Iraq and Afghanistan. And so I thought, what if all the glass studios I know about came together 
and offered a class to veterans as a fun introduction into our craft. All of the studios, they all jumped on it. I started with 25 schools across the country and it's been going on for three years now. After I've finished the color work, I'm going to encase the color with one more gather of clear. When I take that gather, I immediately go to the bench. We block that gather and we're gonna be cooling it and shaping it so that the bubble will blow evenly when we put air into it. The wooden blocks are made out of hardwood. It's like a ladle and it needs to be kept wet. Because it's wet when it touches the glass, it actually creates a layer of steam. The steam will take the heat away from the block and not burn it. And the same with the newspaper. If it's kept wet, the glass will ride along and not burn through. That's why I have the ability to use the newspaper and not burn my hand. It's the closest you come to touching, being able to touch the glass. After I've used the block to shape and cool, we're just gonna be heating the glass where I want it to move and cooling where I want it to stay still. All right, blow, Chad. Stop. So incrementally, we're gonna be getting this bigger. It's starting to expand the bubble now. For this particular vase, I want a cone shape. So I heat the bottom part of the ball I have to hang the piece down using gravity and centrifugal force, and I'm letting the ball go from ball shape to cone naturally. Then Chad prepares the lip wrap. This wrap is like a frame or a finishing, finishing touch on the edge of the piece. And that went on beautifully, yay! Once that's done, we can continue to open the piece. And that's continuously heating, and then going back to the bench and using the newspaper to shape. And we're getting the glass hot enough to manipulate, and then we call it spinning it out and dropping it down, which then gives me the, the ruffle. After we've ruffled the piece, we'll use the torch at the bottom to get that area warm and then get an even temperature throughout the whole thing down to around 1,000. And I take successive heats, usually two or three. Then when I tap my pipe, the vibration will crack the piece off. Chat, he's gonna be placing the piece in a 900 degree oven where the piece needs to cool for 12 hours to make sure there's no internal stress in the glass. The next day, it's at room temperature, I can take the piece out of the oven and then I have to grind the bottom on a, what's called a lap wheel. When it breaks off the punny, there is actually a little remnant of glass and that has to be ground off and then the piece can stand up straight. The very last thing I would do to a piece is use a engraving tool and sign my name and date it. Afternoon light is always kind of beautiful coming into a piece of glass because it'll come down at a, at a lower angle and light the piece as if from within. People think, oh, they'll see my vase and they'll say, I don't want to touch it. And I say to them, you touch glass every day. You pick up a water glass without thinking about it. My pieces are utilitarian. I want them to put their fruit in it and have it as an everyday beauty something that they live with and use and not be fearful that it's too precious, that it needs to be on a pedestal.